Hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting episode of Jimmy's Jambox. We're here. We're back at it again, and we're going to get on into it. But before we do, as always, please make sure to like, subscribe, push all the buttons, do all the things. You know, I don't know where they are, but you do, and I trust you. With that being said, here's a quick word from our sponsors. Organic herbs and botanicals, skin care and edibles, wellness for body and mind. The Brothers Apothecary. Fine teas and remedies. Ronald Records. From indie gems to classic hits, discover the heart of local music. With live shows all the time, up close and personal, and regular releases on their in house label. Ronald Records. Supporting the community, one track at a time. All right, thank you all so much for watching. Again, shout out the Brothers Apothecary, Ronald Records, and Portland Water. Thanks for keeping us hydrated. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get on into it. Here is today's guest. How's it going, everyone? It's Jamie Fortune. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely, man. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, why don't you tell us a little bit about you know who you are, where you're from, what you do. Give us that like Tinder profile of your involvement with music. Yeah, um, I grew up in the Northwest, so actually this is where I'm from. Uh, okay. Grew up kind of in more the Vancouver, Washington area. Gotcha. Oh, and so then, you're like from like here, here. Yeah. Nice. And then moved over to Tigard, Oregon, and that was pretty much like my childhood. Okay. Mostly spent there. I didn't get into hip hop music though until freshman year in high school. Gotcha. Okay. And what, what got you started initially? Yeah. So honestly, the first song or artist where like, I was like, dude, could I do that? Was a uh, 50 cents in the club. Okay. Quality jam. And it's not that like, you know, obviously I'm a young kid. I can't relate to club lifestyle or anything, yeah. anything. but it was the energy mm -hmm. and I'll, it was the energy that kind of commanded some attention it was the confidence and mm -hmm. i really lacked that and so the questions began to form could i do that but it wasn't until that freshman year my sister was dating um an ex who rapped mm. and i was like isaac can you teach me to do that because i was always writing mm -hmm. uh, poetry but you know can you teach me to do it like that? Yeah, it's different when it's like attached to a melodic structure. So different because I'm not uh, delivering my poems that I was writing. Yeah, you, know, you were just kind of doing them. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so he kind of laughed at it, but I was really persistent, kind of like ankle biting, like you got to teach me this, you know, and he, he taught me how to structure rhymes. So it was like A, B, A, you know, like how to make 16 bars. And then I would like work hard on writing one, I'd run back to him like, you know, big brother and kind of like, what do you think? Is this dope? And he'd kind of give me a keep going, man. Yeah. Like, hey, you, sure. we made words. I'm sure it wasn't, <laughs> you know, but just so excited because it kind of ignited the flame. Like well, how, how much older was he than you? Oh, that's a good question. Of course, my perception of it might be yeah. a little bit off. He was hella like, tall. How much, old, how much older was your sister than you at the yeah, time? Yeah, yeah. So she's two years older than me. Okay, so he wasn't he was, like 10 years older mm -hmm. than you. No. So, I mean, he couldn't have been much further along in the journey. You know what I mean? Like, right. not far enough along at least to not have remembered being in exactly the same spot. You know right, what I mean? Right. Yeah. Um, but just his skills. Like, yeah. they had a mixtape out, you know, already. And he had a group of three dudes uh, I remember his name was Money the President. It was Chuck E. Chase and Dallas the Veteran. And they were cash individual boys. But the production of it, because it was like MySpace days, mm -hmm. just seeing their like album artwork and seeing the way they portrayed themselves and listening to the music, they mm -hmm. were actually honest, honest to God, like really good. Yeah. So when I would listen, I was like, oh my goodness, like I'm learning from him. Like maybe one day I could be on their next mixtape, mm. you know, and like that never happened. <laughs> Let's get real. Um, there was a, a bit of a full circle moment with him though that was really cool when he reached out like on Facebook years later mm -hmm. and 
he had told me like, dude, I'm so proud that you stuck with it. So that yeah, was like, hell yeah. Yes. That's shout awesome. Out, yeah, shout out Isaac. Shout out Isaac yeah. for that one. If you want to be on the next mixtape. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> hell yeah. Um, and before we get into more of what you do in the present day, I do have a couple foundation questions I like to check in with everybody on. Let's do it. And yeah, this first one is one we ask early. It's one we ask often, and it's definitely a crowd favorite. What was the first album you ever bought with your own money? <laughs> so... Sorry, I didn't mean. No, you're just, fine. When I got into music, it was in the days of LimeWire. Oh, gotcha. So you know it was like saying? shortly, like so after, like buying seeds. I wasn't can a tell kid. you which album I first bought, but it wasn't like in, in the timeline of things. I hate to admit the fact that for the longest time I was downloading music. That's you know okay. what I mean. I mean, hey, it, there was a point in time where we didn't realize what was. You know what I mean? Like right. LimeWire was just kind of the floodgates for like the introduction to what later became streaming. So it's like true the whole realm there. Yeah. But what was the first one you bought? So the first album that I bought. Was was actually Lecrae. It was a okay. Lecrae album mm -hmm. it's called Rehab. Yeah. And the reason this is actually funny because it's kind of related to that. I had downloaded his first three albums mm -hmm. and then I had a dream that night that just like it was correlated with those albums. It had like food on the table. There were three options and I didn't see anyone around and then I like ate each of the food or something and then I woke up kind of like cold sweat and feeling super guilty because I knew that the food had represented the three albums that I had downloaded even more so it's kind of funny because it was like a Christian hip hop artist yeah. that I'm stealing from but yeah no I just felt really convicted so I like deleted the albums and I was like I gotta support him so at the time the album that he had out that was the latest album was Rehab so mm -hmm. when, I when I bought that with like my own money holding it proudly I'm like I'm gonna just digest this guy from beginning <laughs> to end you know what I mean? Yeah. And just really appreciate the music, which, you know, we were talking a little bit about it before, but there's so much music nowadays, mm -hmm. but I never want to lose the appreciation for it. Yeah. If someone structured it a certain way and put all the work into creating an album, mm -hmm. I want to experience it as an oh, album, you know? Man, I, I will I will die on this hill that, like, the album experience should never go away. Thank I think that, like, you. the arrangement, the thought that goes into it, the, like, decision even on, like, because, you know, people have plenty of songs now like and right. like it's always fun when people are like oh i chose not to pit, put this one on because it didn't work with that like there's so much that goes into it, and it's fun like 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 i don't think people realize that sometimes it's just fun to go through that process Absolutely. and kind of curate something of your own and so that but that's for later in the interview oh, yeah, yeah. um for the next one what was the first live show you ever went to that was like specifically one you wanted to go to yeah so before shows that I had gone to were like not featuring a particular artist, mm -hmm. they were kind of like those big concert venues that had this, that, and the other artist, but it wasn't necessarily when I wanted to go to as much as friends were going, I'm going to go. Mm -hmm. um, but D Smoke came to Portland. Okay. So this is like, wait, it's funny because all of my experiences with music on came a little bit, you know, later, but mm -hmm. D Smoke was on Rhythm and Flow, mm -hmm. that Cardi B show, and he had won it and he came to perform here, I believe it was the Wonder Ballroom. Hmm. I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And tickets were like so affordable for me and my wife to go. It was like, didn't break the bank. Like, and I wish they were more honestly, because the <laughs> show is that good. Dude was like playing piano, mm -hmm. rapping and singing. He performed with his wife, uh, Domani, whose TI son came out and opened. It was just an incredible show. But that was the first one that where like where I'm spending the money and I was just like, this is exciting. I can't wait to get in. I can't wait to see him do his thing. And it, it really like inspires you, you know? Hell yeah. No, I love that. That's awesome. Um, and then actually I should have asked this earlier on in it, but I just we got got to cut up shouting out Isaac. Uh, was anybody else in your household musical at all growing oh, up? Oh yeah, that's a good question. So yes, um my dad was in and out of rock bands ever since I was young, but actually I had a kind of not great relationship. So mm. I despised rock music and that's probably when I found hip hop, why I fell in love with it. It's gotcha. so different. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the church. So then you have worship music that would play every Sunday. And then my mom played piano and sang and her dad, um, you know, was an opera singer. So Japanese oh, okay. dude mm -hmm. uh, went to Italy and his wife supported him to go there to learn. Whoa. And he taught opera when he came back in Tokyo, Japan. To students, so he's probably the most successful musician yeah. in our family. Well, He'd have recitals, and um, my name, Jamie Fortune, is actually based off of 
his experience. Oh, excited. It's my middle name. Sorry. Well, actually, yeah, I was going to say, we're about, we're about to ask that. I'm sorry. So let, me, let me go ahead and transition. We're going to get into you in the present day. Yes, yes. And we're going to get a super easy one out of the way. How did you pick the name? <laughs> sorry. I jumped out of myself. No, you're all good. Uh, yeah, so my middle name is Katsumasa. It means victorious one, mm -hmm. and it was his first name. Mm. So, like... Him being the most successful person in music in our family, he had this story that my mom told, like translated him, uh, he was explaining, she translated it to me, mm -hmm. that he had seen a fortune teller, and the fortune teller told him he was like not going to be very successful unless he legally changed his name. So he changed it from our shared name, Katsumasa, which is a powerful sounding name, yeah. to a different one, and... The reason why Jamie Fortune, for one, was to shout out that fortune teller experience, but to say, hey, I'm going to keep our name, like, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and I'm going to see where it goes from there. So it was that. It's also, uh, my name is spelt J-A-Y-M-E, like, mm -hmm. and there's a skater from from the Portland area named Jamie Fortune. <laughs> so oh, like Shouting out the hometown, shouting mm -hmm. out that experience. And then the last meaning, because, you know, being a hip-hop artist, you're going to do this with words. Yep. <laughs> um, it's just to come into a... A fortune like for real if if I would be so fortunate as to come into any sort of like you know I don't know like if it would take me anywhere else that I could make a living off of music and if I would be able to bless my family through it mm. you know then I would want that too so it's kind of like three yeah the last one's like manifesting almost yeah, yeah yeah and so you know I had rebranded and, and done so many names over the years but you know when I met my wife and and made Jamie fortune it was kind of like this is going to be the last shot. Yeah. I really just stick with this and go for it with yeah. everything I got. I am curious. What were some of the other, like, do you have one that was like super silly as far as like, oh, like go? previous yeah, games? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, so let's see. Let's see. I think what I struggled with the most is at first I didn't have any like monikers. So I was just mm -hmm. going by Jamie, but then someone's like, you need to come up with something. When I was like making jazz hip hop, I went by pneumatic, but it was funny how that came about because uh, pneumatic means like compressed air, but pneuma in the Greek means like the spirit of God. And so I was like trying to make like Christian hip hop, like, mm -hmm. jazz hip hop bars. And so it felt like it fit, but the way it happened, because, you know, most people like come up with this cool name or maybe their friends gave them this nickname since they were younger. But my sister was so annoyed with me because I'm like, Jade, I need a name. And she's like, I don't know, dude, leave me alone. And I'm like, Jade, please help me. You got to name me. I can't name myself. She's like automatic, like all the things that rhyme with that. She's like pneumatic. I was like, wait, what was that? What does that mean? And we're like looking it up on the dictionary. Like it was nothing, you know, super special like that. So I think... I don't know. As silly as it sounds, I, I think it's great to to have this name where I put so much thought into why and like, yeah. let's go forward with that. Um, oh, <laughs> this is funny. This comes to mind because it's on topic. Mm -hmm. When I was trying to rebrand again and I was talking to a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, I was like, okay, I've been brainstorming all day and I've got a name. What do you think about if I went by Milo Maisie? He's like, Milo, what are you, a Disney Channel <laughs> <laughs> like a Disney <laughs> Channel actor? What is that? Milo Maisie. I'll never forget that because he's cracking up, dying. And I'm like, dude, I actually put a lot of thought into that. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not Milo Maisie. I, I need to know what was the thought behind it now. I don't know if I can oh, tell you. I just, okay. I know it was like stressing, trying to come up with something. I, I think I just like the name Milo. I think that's fair. Shiloh is like a movie about a dog and I don't know the sound of it. There was something about it that just well, seemed wasn't kind of there, nice. Wasn't there Milo and Otis? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. And then I think Maisie was literally just like, oh, my brain can be like all over the place because I have ADHD. Oh, so it's so it's like something a, like that. Gotcha. Silly. Okay, okay. I, I get it. It's just like, it's got a ring to it, right? And when he just like, he could have been drinking water, just spit it out of his mouth. He was laughing so hard, you know? I That's was just like, yeah, that name's got to go. <laughs> well, yeah, I will say Jamie Fortune is much better. Much better. You definitely landed on a good one. <laughs> and it's cool because I always do this bit where I break down names. And it's cool because it is, you know, it's your real name. So it's not one that you'll have to like not like you'll have to learn how to respond out to of it. it yeah like yeah. you'll all like you'll be able to hear it and respond to it every time yeah but fortune is a it's a good word it's easy to spell it's easy to remember and it's it's a comfy name all the way around so it's gonna like stick in the ear and later people aren't gonna be like was it was it jack money like yeah. you know yeah. they're not gonna like try to have to do an association to it like right. they're always gonna remember it and i think just before we like leave this topic something like you know, we might be close in age. Uh, it was like Wiz Khalifa, you know, like there was a time Mac Miller mm -hmm. where like 
it was a thing to have a, a first and last name to yeah. you, which I, when I looked at it, I really liked it as opposed to just having like one name, yeah. you know, you are this, I, I don't know. Well, it's, it, it almost could be like a real name. Too, right, like, right, you know, like, right. Uh, shout out Julian Outlaw. Yeah. That's his real name. Like, Wait, Outlaw is his last? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. I didn't even know yeah, that. Yeah, Julian Outlaw. That is his real that. name. That's so dope. But then subsequently, there was a guest who was on the show named Dante Harris. Yeah. Not his name at all. Which is 0% like of real. it. Wow. He was just like, it's just a name that I liked and I thought it'd be a cool name to have. Dang. I was like, you so never know. I purposely never found out what his real name was. I want him to be Dante in my head forever. Man, but that's awesome. That's about them. Let's get back to you. And now we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive on into your writing process. And we're going to break it up into chunks, but we're going to start right at the beginning. So when you get inspired, you're ready to make music. What are some of the things you do to get a track started? Yeah, so it's changed a lot over the years. Where I'm at right now is kind of... I don't always have time to sit down and write. Mm -hmm. So the way I'm looking at it now is even when I'm working at Trader Joe's, like there's these experiences and energy that you're getting. And even in, in the mundane, I'm, I'm getting energy and I'm feeling things. And normally I can feel it almost like loading. Like there's something I want to say. I don't know exactly what I'm going to say, but I feel mm -hmm. something there. Then what it looks like practically is when I sit down at my computer and I open up a beat pack that a friend has sent me, or open up beat stars and just surf. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm seeing if anything pulls on those strings, you know. And then I might go, oh, it's probably this one. Like, and if it's beat stars, for example, download the free one just to work it first to see. And then if it's gonna be something, lease it for sure. Yep. Definitely support producers. Yep. Don't grab YouTube beats. Like, <laughs> there's nothing cool about that. Support people, and um, and yeah. So then I'll I'll session with it some, and you know what it looks like is uh. Kind of like freestyling gibberish almost. Yeah. Just like going off of the vibes and what are the first words that are coming up? What would this song even be about? Where am I at? And sometimes it's funny because I'll like sit on something and I'm like, this isn't it. So I've learned now not to like beat a dead horse. It's mm -hmm. just like throw that one aside for a second. Not that it can't be it. If I like the beat, cool. Let's revisit it later. But yeah. where I'm at isn't that one. You load up a different one. And oftentimes, if it's been a long, like a long while since I've written... It just floods out, mm -hmm. and it's almost like the song writes itself. Those are the best times, because yeah. the ones that I've racked my brain around and really stressed, like, I need to finish this, I need to write this, seldom are they ever ones I like afterwards, and uh, usually people appreciate the ones. I think it, there's something to be said with it. Like, the ones that took me the least amount of time were the ones most celebrated. Yeah. Maybe because you didn't overthink it so much, it was the most authentic. Mm -hmm. You know? And, like, I think the music, when it's such a short thing, it almost, the music is writing itself to a degree. Like, you're so caught in the, like, the movement of the sound that right. you're almost focusing more on, like, the melodic elements and, like, the structure as it's presenting itself versus you right. being like, next it needs to be this, next it yeah. needs to be that. And also I think there's a subconscious layer to it as well. Like, you probably present that track a little bit differently when you do it live and things like that because it's just you don't, like there's something about the way you attach the extra effort to the other tracks versus the ones where you're like, oh, this track, I guess I could, like, this took me no time at all. Yeah, yeah. It just feels more effortless when presented even. Which you bring up a really interesting point. So when I was first writing music, I'm not performing it. Mm -hmm. Then when I actually went out to go perform and you see how people receive mm -hmm. what you made, one, the exchange is like always daunting because it's you spilling your heart in any measure. But it, but what was really interesting was seeing how someone reacted to what I thought was going to be the turn up song or something mm -hmm. crazy. They didn't. And then you're like, how can I adjust it or rewrite it in a way where there might be a call and response or in a way where this mm -hmm. could be more fun or if the drop happens sooner or the chorus or, you know, stuff like that. And it, it's funny because it did affect the way that I would approach songs sometimes, not all yeah. the time. Sometimes you are just journaling almost. But like sometimes you are considering if this was live, I think it'd be pretty cool. Like, you know. Yeah. Considering that avenue. Well, that and I think at a certain point, once you've got a catalog, even like you get to choose which songs are performance songs and which songs are like, you know, singles or album songs are just right. there for the sake of. Right. And, you know, that not that there, there's not a right or wrong one. It's just, you know, you get to kind of decide which direction some tracks go. And some you even know right from the get. Totally. And I think it's interesting when like I, I've noticed, especially just from doing this for so long, you can tell when somebody starts knowing when they're writing something for 
for live because you can tell where the breaths are in the song. Yeah. And like that they're writing it with like the intent to like be able to like in real life. And that, that's like, that's kind of the tell for like who has been focusing on their music long enough to like know they need to prepare the song that way. Yeah. I mean, ser- like when I first started performing, it's just the instrumental. Yeah. That's what I was used to. So I would actually catch, you know, moments where I didn't create those breaths or where mm-hmm. it overlapped, where it would have been good to have a buddy to like go into the chorus while you're just finishing yeah. your verse. And then later, uh, you know, making sure I can succeed, like writing it in a way where there is time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and actually on your interview with Dwilly, I remember him saying oh, in the that East was Coast, shout out Dwilly. In the East Coast, he was like, you know, they would just cut the track if it had any backing mm-hmm. vocals on it at all. And I think because I ran that way a little bit, when I first came out onto the scene in Portland, my tracks were like more bare bones like that. And then later, as I kind of observed what people were doing, there's certainly people that will just rap over the song, mm-hmm. which is so hard to hear. <laughs> like, it's honestly like just, you know, but when people uh, would sing or rap over just a little bit of backing, it was really cool. And yeah, so I was, like, like I the ad lib. Yeah, yeah, having some ad libs or just like a quiet, quieted chorus so that it kind of builds when they sing with it. Or I don't know. I, I think, honestly, I don't think there's necessarily a wrong way, but definitely less busy in the live setting because people came there, they want to hear you. Yeah, exactly. Not, they don't want to hear perfect. And that's what I didn't understand before. Mm-hmm. They want to feel the energy. They yeah, want they want to feel change. that presence of like, you, they know you are doing it. Yep. And I even, I, and, and this isn't something I talk a lot about on the show, but uh, when I was when I was in my last band, Smooth Talk, uh, I did Talk Box, which is like, it's like a very digital sounding. Yeah, like so cool. Yeah, and so it... Because it's the one instrument and like you can't like make extra things happen at once, uh, I had some harmonies that I would do in in small spots that, you know, like that had to happen at the certain times, like they had to happen in these certain ways. And I think the big thing that separates it for a lot of people as far as the performance goes is when you take the time to rehearse with those moments, because if you miss them, even by a smidge, then it no longer sounds tight and that makes it sound chaotic. Right. But when you nail it and it's almost seamless to the point where people are like, wait, why does his voice suddenly sound like 10,000 times bigger yeah. for just these impactful moments? Right. And not only does it sound better, but it's going to make that moment more impactful. So like the words that you're trying to portray in that, that moment are going to be more easily heard. They're going to be more likely to attach. But also for the people who aren't quite aware of the process, it's going to like create this inner feeling for them that they're going to be like, whoa, like right. what, like I, what is this moment happening? And that's, mm-hmm. you know, that's memorable. Right. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like, there's nothing wrong with having like, like I said, like ad libs or like extra layers for like harmony moments and things right. like that. But for the, you know, for the people who are doing it when they're first starting out, it really comes down to like, how much are you taking the time to perfect that performance element? Totally. Not just being like, oh, it's there so that when I do this, I can like, you know, mess up a little bit or I could do like, right. those are the moments that need to be rehearsed. So the right. less of them you have, the more you get that organic moment of you can just do the song. Mm-hmm. So that's just, that's just my experience from that time. No, I feel that. And how many times maybe even you could relate to where, say, I've heard a show, uh, go, gone to a show, heard a song live, mm-hmm. and look it up afterwards, and it means more. Because mm-hmm. It reminds you of the experience you had yeah. with the artist, even if you didn't talk to him, but like hearing it then, mm-hmm. and you listen to it in your car and stuff, and you know it doesn't hit as hard, but you're comparing it in a good way to that, and you're like, it creates that like memory. So you buy into the song even more so because mm-hmm. you're just like, I support this artist because that was dope. And I think when I think about it as a fan first, then I have to realize as an artist to be brave to go out and do those things. That's what you're creating for someone else. Exactly. So. And actually that segues well into the next part. Once you get a track finished writing, so it doesn't have to be like release per se, but once you're ready to start memorizing it, you're starting to like getting ready to put it out there. How long does it usually take you to feel comfortable enough to perform a track? Yeah, this is a good question. So the same friend who laughed super hard at my name, my homie, mm-hmm. his brain is like a, I don't know what you call it, like steel trap, if that's the word. Like he mm-hmm. can memorize anybody's lyrics. Like he doesn't make music himself, but I mean like artists' lyrics, songs for days, including yeah. mine. He would hear it one time and he would just know. Whoa. And I don't know 
how? <laughs> and then I wish that I had that ability because I will be, when I'm writing, you know, when you're recording, you don't always get it in the first take. So you're doing tones and whatever, and you're, you're learning it as you go. But even then, maybe from working like multiple songs or whatever the reason being, it's so hard to remember sometimes what line goes to the next. So it's yeah. actually pretty easy for me to flub my own lyrics. And I wish that wasn't the case, but I, I would be lying if I was not honest to say that when I'm out at a show, usually somewhere I mess up. And what I've needed to learn to do is like, if you do, don't freak out. Like, yeah, pull attention yeah. to it. Just keep going as if it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even if I rehearse and that's the craziest part, I think I just get nervous. Yeah. The butterflies. It's mm -hmm. like, man, people are going to be experiencing this. Like, I hope I do well. And it might be like the same with uh, athletes in sports when they are imagining if they're going to make a shot or something, they have to imagine that they're going to make it, not that it bounces off the rim. But mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes my brain will be my worst enemy and kind of, it might bounce off the rim. And it's like, no, it won't. I've practiced so many times. And then it kind of does. And you're yeah. like, damn it. So yeah, yeah just wor working on that. Uh, I would say that that's probably my weakest area as an artist, if I'm being honest. And so it actually deters me a bit from performing live more than I'd like to. Interesting. I actually enjoy it. When I'm up there and something takes over and I feel it being more spiritual, I've mm -hmm. been experiencing connecting with others. I enjoy that. But uh, I don't enjoy like this inner self-made pressure of like, will this come out the way that I want it to? God. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting you say that because like you said, you had acknowledged before how like the need for the performance to be perfect is not really the point of the mm -hmm. performance. Yeah. So I, I, I'd i be curious. We, we won't dig into it too much on yeah, here, yeah. Um, but I, I would be curious to kind of dig into that a little bit further and see like where the line really is on that. Right. We can talk about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> but getting back into this, I did take a moment and I checked out some of your music online and awesome. uh, on Spotify, you've got music going all the way back to 2013. Yes. And you may have one of the biggest catalogs I've seen yet. <laughs> uh, and, and that's that's a broad stroke. I'm sure plenty of people have plenty. Of, but uh, like you're up there with like Machado Majiga. You have uh, so much music. And usually I pride myself on being able to listen to everything before somebody comes on the show. I could not do that with yours. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. But I listened to as much of it as I could. And I went all the way back. And even like even on your Tall Tales EP, you clearly had a knack for this. Like you knew what you wanted. You knew the direction you were going. And what was cool is that as time progressed through your music, because I tried to go as linear as I could, there was, it always sounds like you, but it, 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 it grew in, in, a, in more the sense of your attention to the music that was happening, mm. your ability to get more expressive, your ability to kind of, kind of, you know, take almost the dually approach and like, open up in the way that the song needed to. Yeah. But you never, you have your style. So it's cool because now when I hear any music, I will know if it's a Jamie Fortune track, but it's not like after listening to 10 of them, I was like, oh my God, I've already listened to 10. Like each one has its own experience. Each one has its own thing. And, uh, and this is kind of a weird take, but I was try. I always try to think of like, what does, what do things remind me of? And, this again might be my strangest one yet, but you you're like if Abby the Nomad was signed to strange music, but it was all based in the West Coast. <laughs> That's super cool. Yeah, I know, I know Abby the Nomad. Yeah, and like because because so, you have this broad dynamic. You've got really chill tracks. You've got really like high energy tracks. Your beat selection is phenomenal. Like big fan. Like it just you know, all every track you pick seems to have kind of a cool intention in it. But even like your most recent track, uh, "Let Me Breathe." Uh, first of all, sonically, it's super bouncy. Like it's got this really like kind of like up and down feel to it. But lyrically, it felt very vulnerable. Like it felt like you know the the, the message by. And I'm not I'm not a big lyrics guy. I'm gonna be honest. That's not where my ears usually go. Yeah. But that is just where like I like I couldn't not listen to them. Like it just it, it was clear that there was an emotion behind it, and you portrayed it well for even the track being a little more bouncy. Cool. Um. And then I usually do this bit where I pick out a track that I really liked. And I tell you it, but for some reason, it didn't make it to my notes. But I have to pull it up here and say this. This is the last bit, I promise. I couldn't pick. I couldn't pick one. You had too many cool tracks. And so instead of doing a track breakdown, I'm going to go through a small list of ones I really enjoyed. 
And I, it was Double Dragon, Legacy, Bang, Fly. I just took another selfie, Family Portrait. And for the first time in show history, I'm picking a track again. Yada, yada. Oh, cool. Yep, yep. <laughs> now, shout out Dwilly again. Shout out Dwilly again. When I, cr- when I stumbled across that one again, I was like, oh my God, I know this track. And then I was like, wait, it was on Dwilly. So, but... but <laughs> Your music is really cool. Uh, that, that's kind of the takeaway I want to get from is you, you, your intention, your drive towards your sound. It is so refined at this point. It's so well put together. But I appreciate that you have your catalog of music going all the way back, kind of like what we we're saying off camera yeah. about how, you know, it's hard to see where artists even come from because they mm-hmm. take it all away. They try to hide it. Yep. You don't. So it's cool that I can listen to your new music and be like, oh, it's Jamie Fortune. I can go and listen to your old music and go, oh, it's Jamie Fortune and taking the time to experience all of it. Your growth is so trackable. It's so present to see how you grew and evolved in your music. So I just wanted to leave that here for you. Um, but I am curious to know, what are some of your favorite tracks? First off, if I knew that I was going to get showered with things oh. <laughs> like this, that alone was worth the trip to the show. That was like... You know, it's hard to receive those, like, you know, but it's awesome. It just makes me feel like you really, like, took the time to listen, which is really, really special. And uh, and thank you. When you were going through the list of some of your favorites, that was just awesome because it kind of, like, in my head, the way I was receiving it was like, oh, yeah, they represent times of your life, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that's the only way to look at a catalog is, like, I remember kind of where we were at at the time, who I was working with, what my mindset might have been. But it means a lot because as any artist, like we pride ourselves in wanting to sound like something different or sound like ourselves. Mm-hmm. Are we portraying who we are? And, um, you know, I'm from that era where it's like, you know, Snoop Dogg sound very different than Eminem, mm-hmm. very different from 50 Cent, very different from Tupac or Biggie, right? These are all iconic voices. And I think that that's why it's like, oh, I want to want to do that you know something like that to where it's like recognizable Mm -hmm. who i am you know and uh so anyway thank you for that but out of all the songs because i was kind of going on a tangent you're good my favorite i think right now it's actually one of the newer ones it's um something's gotta go Mm -hmm. and uh it's got a similar feel to let me breathe it's just a little bit more like uh i don't know like down a downbeat kind of like slower and what it was was just this transitionary period. Like I got a baby on the way in two months. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, it's that in-between time. I was talking about more or less how in order to make space for something new, something has to go. And what I was talking about mostly was like, I've been pursuing music for 16 years now. Mm-hmm. And it's it's been a huge driving force behind what makes me come alive. But also like, I just haven't seen what I want to see from it yet. I've seen a lot of cool things, met a lot of cool people, but it hasn't, like, my goal with it is that it would create some level of income. It doesn't have to be the most ever, but you know there's just such a range Yeah. with that stuff. If it was enough to live off of that I could wake up every day and confidently say, like, I'm making money off of what I love to do, to me, that's a joy. And people love to fight back saying, like, you know, People say, uh, do what you love. You'll never work a day in your life. It's not true. Everything becomes work. You know, in some measure, I could see that, but I disagree. Like, because I got to do it. Um, When I was working at Apple and COVID hit, then, you know, uh, they didn't have any infrastructure for what we would do. So we're all home. Most people were watching Netflix. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I knew a paycheck was coming. I was like, dude, I'm waking up. I'm making music. And then at a certain time, I'll cut it off and I'll spend time with my, you know, girlfriend, now wife. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, like, that was the plan and I treated it really serious. And I was like, this is the first time in my life, I think, that I'm being paid to do what I love. Like, not little, you know hundred bucks or something here and there. It was like a consistent, like I'm paying my bills off this right now in my brain. That was pretty cool. So I was like, you know, I could get used to that. And uh, so something's got to go is is special in that sense. Sonically, it's special because uh, the guy who made the beat, Mm -hmm. he goes by swimming right now, but Mm -hmm. uh, used to be John Wonder. Shout out, John. Uh, We had a a small like group of the three of us, me and our friend, Brian, uh, Mm -hmm. DJ Cross. And that was the most fun I've ever had in music. But like come full circle now, he sent me this beat. He's like, it's like the days where we made jazz hip hop music, you know, and he mixed it and mastered it for free. And he's worth the money now. He's so good. And he like gets hired by clients. But he was like, nah, dude, it's all good, man. This is just for you. So he hooked it up. 
and it sounds great. And it's just one of my, like, it'll always be like a special one, you know? Oh yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. And for just that insight in general, I think that I, I have very mixed feelings on the, like the desire to like make an income like that, that narrative, because there, there's this weird middle ground that I've gained from like talking to so many people about how like the passion creates outlets when, you know, when you don't have one eye just focused on the target. Right. Um, but at the same time, like music is, is never been, it's never been easier to make money in music in a way that is sustainable. Back in the day, it was all or nothing. You had your big goliaths of music and then you had the people who were playing in the local dive bars. That, right, right, right. And there was, there was no visibility of even an in-between. So the concept couldn't exist. Now it is so much more of an option. So many avenues. Yeah. So finding that I think is when you do, it's like one of those things where it's like, that's something that if you can build on and if you can explain to people, it becomes like a more valuable experience in the long run, even. Right. And, and just being a student, student of that, like, I can't tell you how many interviews I've dug up podcasts mm -hmm. I've devoured, especially, um, Nick D and Connor Price are, these dope artists uh, that I discovered off TikTok, but they do this podcast called Independent, and they really have tried super hard to like break down behind the scenes yeah. on spending money on ads and maybe how much, or, oh, Nick D never spent money on ads, but here's how many pieces of content he was cr cranking yeah. out, you know, and just explaining, but also calling out certain outliers, like, oh, I was blowing up during COVID times when people were pretty down and inside and my music was poppy and fun. So it was like, he calls out certain things that you cannot recreate, but it was his experience. But he talks about like the character and the work ethic necessary to at least give yourself a shot. Yeah. And and the way I look at it too is like, it's more like if you stay in the game, you're more likely to make a shot yeah. than if you were to sit down on the bench. And if you're, you know, uh, Gary V calls them at bats, mm -hmm. you got to keep swinging because you don't know which one's going to be a home run, but you'll get better too in the progress of doing this. Exactly. It's like social media is at bats, uh, music is at bats. And, um, but you know, we were talking about how it's very like, um, it's like music is so much more than just business. Yeah. So I think remembering to get my fulfillment from that to, mm -hmm. to be like, look at all that we've been able to make over yeah. the course of the years is enough to be celebrated and uh, leaving open wherever that might be take me, you know, I think even getting to sit down here, getting to talk with you just because of this like interest, that's amazing. Getting to work with someone like Dwilly or any of the artists that met me in the Portland scene, you know, you go out there thinking maybe no one will like what I have to share. And then you find the opposite usually is like, yeah, you'll get some haters, but I mean, you find the opposite. People are celebrating it. They want to work together. And, um, that part's really special. So I can't forget any of that. Either, no, very much you know? so. And I think, you know, it's, it, there's a fine line between like wanting like notable acknowledgement and the like act, like appreciating right. the function of the creation. So it's very like at a certain point, I always referred to music as my sand garden. It was something where it's like, you know, I would often make music just for the sake of like I, I had I had a weekly music session with other people. It was like it happened in a space. We had to go to it and do it. And the only requirement was we couldn't record any of it. Huh. Zero percent of it could be recorded. The only point of it was to play music. Dude, that's and dope. and they and they they fought me on it for so long. Like they were like, "Wait, what are you talking about? What have we come up with this? What do we come up with the coolest?" But then over time, because we did it for I think a little over a year, and in the beginning. You know, we would play stuff and it was fine. And like, it would take us like 20 minutes to warm up. We'd play for like an hour and a half and we'd be done. Yeah. By the time we were done, it took us maybe five minutes to warm up and we would play for like three to four hours. But then the trade off of that was when we would go and sit down in our respective music making spaces where we created music. Right. It took us minutes to come up with new ideas. It took us seconds to come up with transitions. It come up with any like you were flexing the muscle. Yeah, like we we got you know we took swings very in cool. this space that was basically a batting cage, and so by the time we got to the point where we needed to actually do the work, our ten bad ideas were out of the way by leaps and bounds. It yeah. was only this like wealth of creativity and desire because we didn't have to think about, oh, let's stop this flow state and hit a button or make sure something is on or do. No, we were just, we were just playing. Yep. And so we like got through it in such a way that we like gained endurance 
And that I think is something that is not practiced well enough in the creative process anymore. Yeah. Like, and it's it's not something that can be like functionally done. Like it's just something that comes from time. Right. And so uh, that I'm sorry though. I'm oh. I'm tangenting on me. Let's get back to you. And let's take a moment and let's talk about some new music you're working on. What are what are some of the things we can look forward to as far as like what's coming up next? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest one right now that I'm excited about. So I released a song last year mm -hmm. uh, called Lean On Me. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I first made it, I loved it because it was like this one where I felt like I really spilled some of my guts mm -hmm. on, the, on the record. Yeah. And then um, at the time, my funds were kind of low. So a homie helped mix it for me, uh, Escape the Tiger, and he did he did an awesome job. Um, but for whatever reason, probably just where I was at at the time, I got self-conscious about it. Maybe because I spilled, I don't know, but I didn't push it what I felt it deserved, so it just kind of got buried away, and it was just like, okay, the next song, I'll just push the next one or make a better one, and so mm -hmm. I forgot about it. And then um, a good friend of mine, Silas One Wolf, before he moved across to the East Coast, he was telling me, like, don't forget about this one. He said, this one's one of my favorites. And how you like my song, Soldier, he goes, this is your soldier. Mm -hmm. So he said, please make, like, more content for it. People need it. So that, like, rang in my ear. And then, um, I don't know. I think I just kind of wanted to give it, like, a new face. So this thought came through my mind, like, let me try to get it remastered. Because people mm -hmm. do that kind of thing. So send it off to... Uh, you know, a different homie to give it another spin. And um, now I'm working, you know, uh, planning some visuals for it as well okay. with uh, Zach Olson. Oh, yeah. Uh, so Zospan. And uh, we're going to try to create some, like, social media specific content instead of a music video so we can have, a, you know, multiple. Uh, but give it a push. So that's what I'm working on right now. It's like a single. But I'm excited about it because I never really gave that one the light of day that I felt it deserved. Gotcha. So we're going to try it, try again. Oh yeah. Well, definitely looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, for this next one, let's take a moment and let's zoom out. Let's look at kind of music as a whole. Yeah. What are some of the things about either new music in general? So if you're one of those people that's taken in new music all the time, or at the very least music that's new to you that you've recently experienced that you enjoy and you're finding inspiration in at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so I was playlist building for a while because I was just thinking like, hey, this would be cool. Maybe this would be an interesting venture. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I was listening to so much different kinds of music, music that I love, but also new ones. And um, what do I think about music as a whole? I think similarly to what we were talking about off camera, how you were saying a lot of people talk about the overexposure. As an artist, I think that's the word that comes to mind first where it's kind of like, how on earth do I get my stuff out there? You'll feel that a little bit, but you're right. It's totally a, an exciting time more than it is a difficult time because there is so much, there's a lot to celebrate. There's a lot to get inspired by mm -hmm. even from across the world. You know, you listen to like a K-pop song where you're like, I love how they did that, you know, and I don't even know what they're talking about, but like in the melody or in the flows that the rappers use or something. And it's just, there's so much uh, to digest and, and to bring in into yourself as far as like the, like where people feel maybe lost in the mix, I think it's an opportunity to ask yourself um, a couple things. But one of the ones that I think about is if I believe in something, then let me give it my best foot forward to share it. Yeah. However, I, I know how. And and if you're truly excited about something, like I think La Russell gave the best advice. He said people worry about posting too much. But he's like, you know, if you're excited about something, post. Mm -hmm. If you're really excited, I just, I just saw, saw that. that. Yeah, I did he, see that. He was like, if you're excited, post. That was, and for some reason, it clicked because I feel like, oh, I don't want to be a nuisance. I don't want to be annoying. But if you're really excited about, say, like a new episode that you edited down, or you know, I'm excited about this new song, Lean on Me. I should just post like with reckless abandon because I'm just happy about it. You yeah. Know? And that should be motivation enough. Not worried about, will it offend anybody? Will anyone be annoyed? If they're truly annoyed, they can unfollow and they might follow back later. Like it doesn't matter. But the people that you're feeding are the people that are interested and they're mm -hmm. excited that you're excited and that energy is contagious. So that was kind of like a tangent. But what I'm saying is on music as a whole, I think what artists need to get over is this idea of like, Mm, we get in our way a lot of times. Yeah. And instead of doing that in a variety of ways, some might be over perfectionists. So they're like listening to a single snare sound at mm -hmm. EQ for like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like hours. Or uh, it might, you know, be on these records where you have self doubt. So you bury them away. 
And um, ultimately, I think if artists celebrated what they created more, got excited, then they would be excited to share it live. They'd be excited mm -hmm. to post it on distro and then like make content for it, not as a chore, but because like, I can't wait for people to hear this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So very, I think it's an opportunity. So. You know, it's an opportunity for us. Oh, yeah. No, I love that. Um, now, before we move into the next part, this next question is probably the densest question in the interview. But we talked a lot about your experiences of music, the actions, the reactions. But when it's just you and the music one on one, what does music give back to you? That is a dense question because there's been seasons where it gives back a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it helped me find confidence in myself because I was a really quiet kid. I was bullied in school. It gave me like a voice. So that was when it was giving a lot. 16 years in, you can lose sight of that first love that you had for your craft. And there was a time where it was like, why am I even doing this? Like getting a ton of hate. Uh, and they wouldn't even see the sacrifices that I make to try to do this, whether it was like cutting down hours from work or, uh, you know, uh, staying up super late, lack of sleep, like whatever it might've been, you know, uh, to where I feel like I'm giving like everything. And then someone would just like bla bla blanket statement, like it's trash but they wouldn't give me anything to work off of. Like, what's trash about it? What can I make better? And I think during those times, it got kind of dark. And especially if you're like by yourself, then I actually started to resent resent it a little bit. Sort of like if I was interested in business or something more lucrative, I'd be in a better position. So why on earth did I fall in love with something that was going to like put me in this position? Or, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I felt like I was kind of in a dark place then. And um, my wife helped me really like a lot to climb out of that space. Mm -hmm. I think I can be my own worst enemy as of today. I'm excited about this. This is crazy. This thought dawned on me. The fact that like money aside or future goals or success aside, the fact that I have a place to record and a person to send it to to get it cleaned up, mm -hmm. that's a gift in and it of itself because I realized I can make whatever song I want to make. Mm -hmm. Like no one is stopping me. And when I really thought about the freedom that's in that, it was pretty crazy. I started to fall in love with it again. It's like, you know, I don't want to stir stuff up just to stir it up, but I'm saying, like, if there's something important to talk about, I can do that. No one is saying, here's the quota. Here's what I need from you. As an independent artist, I can do that. And that just felt really empowering. So I think I've got a fresh wind recently where I'm like, I'm excited to see what I make next because I don't know what it's going to be. And ultimately, that's what I love about it most. When I'm stocking shelves at Trader Joe's, it's very linear and it's a certain thing that they want by the end of the day. Yeah. When you approach music and you approach uh, like the canvas that is the instrumentation or whatever, or you're adding layers, like it's endless in its scope of what it's going to become. And then at the very end, you stand back and look at it and you're like, that was awesome. Let's do it again. Like, you know, so that level of like exploration and freedom, I think I could probably speak on behalf of most artists. That's what we love about it the most. Yeah. Like, it can be anything you want it to be. And so that part's really cool. Hell yeah. Oh, that was a great answer. Thank you so much for sharing yeah. that. All right. But now we're going to go ahead and we're going to move on to some hypothetical questions. And for these, sky's the limits. The questions are all made up. So the answers are allowed to be as well. All right. Uh, this first one's pretty straightforward. If you could work with any one person, uh, yeah. the only requirement is they have to be alive. Okay. Who would you want to work with and how would you want to work with them? Yes, this is awesome. Because I was actually thinking about it. <laughs> I really was. Um, so first I, I would want to say J Cole, but the thing is, I don't think I could hang. So then I was like, oh no, maybe not, maybe not Cole. I mean, I do, got a, I do got a good one. Um, Mike Shinoda, Mike Shinoda, okay. huge one. I feel like I would be able to hang because I've done a couple records that are kind of rockish mm -hmm. inspired. And, um, it's just the fact that like he was a huge influence when I first started out because I was like, that guy kind of looks like me, you know? Mm -hmm. And maybe I could sound like that. At the time, I didn't have a, like a voice yet. Yeah. You know, I was still discovering. So when you're first rapping, you're emulating. Mm -hmm. so I was like emulating Tupac, you know, emulating Jay-Z's like cool swagger, like emulating. And you're like, okay, trying to find it. But when I heard him uh, in Fort Minor specifically, mm -hmm. that like hip hop, uh, and he actually worked with Jay. And then I was like, oh my goodness, this guy is so freaking cool. And I liked him from, you know, Linkin Park days. But I'm saying like when I heard him rap, I was like, maybe I could do that. So it was like a huge inspiration. So to come full circle when people get to meet their heroes, if I ever got to like work with Mike Shinoda, that would be a dream. Oh yeah, you that'd know? be rad. Yeah. 
And uh, subsequently, who's a local artist that you're aware of that you haven't gotten to connect with yet, but you would like to? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> there are so many. Um, ones that come to the to mind first is uh, like there are some really dope female vocalists in mm-hmm. Portland. Uh, Victoria Abbott, Alana Rich, Vina, Vina, all dope. And and I've been like near sessions where they got to work with friends of whatever, you know, but I, I've never worked with them like one-on-one myself. Yeah. So that would be like really cool. Hell yeah. Well, everybody, you know what to do. At them in the comments. Let's see if we can make that happen. <laughs> yeah. Including Mike Shinoda. Let's do it. Dude, yes. <laughs> and then uh, for this next one, like I said before, sky's the limits and it's pretty literal in this sense. But if you could perform anywhere in the world and you wouldn't have to worry about crowd access or building stability or power, it was guaranteed the best lineup, guaranteed the best show, and it doesn't have to be a venue. It could be anywhere. Where would you want to perform? Wow. On the moon. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. The first person to rap on the moon. No, I'm I'm playing. Um, Hmm. You know, I think whenever I see photos of like my favorite artists and they're doing those huge like sea of phones lit up Mm -hmm. in this thing i just couldn't imagine what that would even feel like you know so i think if i were to ever get to experience that even once mostly to hear you know when they like the audience is singing their song Mm -hmm. that would probably just make me bust into tears like to come all that way and have people sing back your record then they really took the time to learn it or it means something to them Mm -hmm. more than the venue size it's mostly that. Like, if I were able to perform somewhere and hear them, like, sing back lyrics that I wrote uh, that meant, you know, something to them, I, I think that would just be so surreal. Hell yeah. That's kind of, like, what I'm contending for, if at all possible, in any measure, would be really cool. Because even, like, at this interview, you did your research to listen to songs. I had some customers in Trader Joe's found out I made music and two, three weeks later they found me in the frozen section and they're like, we listened and you could tell they listened because they dropped name titles, lyrics, things they liked about it. And, and that means so much as an artist, Mm -hmm. that means the world, you know? So I think, yeah, that'd be super cool. Oh yeah. That's a really cool answer. (laughs) All right. And then to wrap up the hypothetical questions, if you could get one more album from anybody, they could be alive, they could be dead. They could have not put out an album in a hundred years. They could have put out an album yesterday. Yeah. Who would you want an album from? Who would I want an album from? Hmm? Oh, I thought you were giving me an answer. No, I like, yeah. There are so many, but if I could get an album from anybody. I feel like, so, J. Cole is uh, working on the fall off, Mm -hmm. and I feel like it's because he's trying to focus on his basketball career, Mm -hmm. but I'm a huge fan, so I don't want to just hear the fall off and then he disappears. Like, I like being able to grow with this artist because when he first came out onto the scene, he's rapping about a lot of the same stuff that his peers were. Mm -hmm. Sounds like, you know, a guy that's like breaking a lot of women's hearts and you know what I mean? And then he like grows tremendously Mm -hmm. each album. But in 2014, Forest Hills Drive, he gave us like this masterpiece of an album, in my opinion. And so like, you know, I wouldn't want him to disappear. So like even M's making death of slim shady stuff like that like i would love to hear another album from that guy only because like i really devoured his catalog Mm -hmm. so i would appreciate to see whatever he had whatever it was yeah hell yeah yeah no i think that definitely cool all right uh and actually it's cool it's rare that i get like an answer that's like not somebody who's like gone you know what i mean everybody always like leans towards someone just like they're not here anymore so we'll never get something that is kind of a cool one to be like he may just be not making like for my my go to answer is always Childish Gambino. Yeah, and he has officially announced that he's going to be done. That 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 Ata Vista was the last one, or not Ata Vista, I'm sorry, with I forget the names of things. I'm the worst. Um, but like, <laughs> just you know, like this is the end of his music career, and I'm just so sad because I've always enjoyed the experience from it. So I want one more from yeah. him. But uh, also, I want to see the show, so I can't wait for him to come back now. Off camera, my wife kept mouthing Mac Miller. Oh, uh, yeah. And that's like without being said. See, that's, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> just one of those answers that like, there, he, like, he's like Jimi Hendrix, where like there was an arc to the music that we hadn't even begun to see like 
the beginning of the going over. Like it was exactly. just such a heavy incline I, in the performance and like in the experience and like the ability to grow was just so there to have that like taken away. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like the people who know him the best are the ones that suffered the most. But as a listener, we will never even get to fathom what potentially could have been because we only got to see the finished products. True. And I just feel like from like the first record I heard from Mac Miller, because I wasn't like a, a huge fan when he came out onto the scene with Donald Trump, I was like, not feeling it. And it yeah. was like a skip record for me. I'm just being honest mm-hmm. to see the growth into when he make, made records like Stay, mm-hmm. on Divine Feminine, yeah. and the concept behind it to like the swimming album where he's making all these really, they're grown up records, mm-hmm. grown up human, very well developed, finding his voice and just owning it. Yeah. His singing and all of his heart and soul that he put into them. You're right. It was like an upward trajectory that if he was still around, what would the next album sound like? Yeah, exactly. Probably something mind blowing. Exactly. <laughs> All right, but with that being said, we're going to go ahead and start wrapping this up. Yeah. What can we look forward to between, let's say, now and March? Yeah, definitely uh, the new uh, remastered single, Lean On Me. Mm-hmm. Um, those visuals that uh, Zospan and, and me are going to create. I don't know what, but I know he's always so dope with it, so it's going to be something cool. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be exciting because a lot of the social media that I've been pushing like, has just been something I edit on my own. And yeah. so... To see someone else's take on the music is always exciting. Um, not not that there's anything on the books here, because mostly with my schedule, I've just been kind of like working out singles. Mm-hmm. But in the future, just like in my blueprint of mind, I would love to get back into album mode, create mm-hmm. something like full just for the sake of, even though people argue singles are the way to go for the sake of time and money. It's like, I want to create another body of work, something more cohesive. And then... Um, I would love to collaborate with more people this year. You know, collaboration is a double-edged sword. And this is why I say this, because it is the best thing you'll ever do as an artist and the most annoying thing you will ever do. Working with someone else's schedule, Mm -hmm. uh, someone else's budget, Mm -hmm. whether they flake out and don't want to do it, whether they get nervous and like, oh, take that down, da, da, da. Yeah. All of the above has happened to me. Or they get some type of way and you you can't put it out because this, that, and the other, and you have to wait two years for something to come out. It's not throwing shade. It's just explaining the facts. Like So I think that pushes me where I'm mostly like, I, I'm going to make my records and finish them on my own. But the reality is whenever you get anyone else's hands involved, no matter to what degree, it's always way better than it could have been. Because yeah, because it's going to be ideas that you've never felt or experienced exactly. before. Yeah, I think about like feature films and all the names on the credit list when it's like so-and-so did this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. And that's why they're so incredible mm-hmm. you know, for the most part. Yeah, and, and they come out on a timely matter. You know, Otherwise, if, if it was one mastermind making this movie, it would take like 10 years to get his movie because it would just take too much of him exactly so i think with music why would it be any different we see the you know the credits of someone that helped with lyric writing and someone who added these instruments and you know they make a demo sometimes first and then that becomes the actual thing and seldom have i ever made a demo i've literally like this is the song and it goes out you know yep. but if i had a panel of people where they're like that sounds more like a demo let's rework it that would be really cool i've just never had the luxury so i think definitely i want to collaborate with people more to help grow myself oh yeah well definitely looking forward to that uh, for this next one go and look straight at the camera yep. tell everybody how they can find you yes you can find me uh at jamie fortune so right on the hoodie uh j-a-y-m-e uh fortune like a cookie or fortune teller and that's on instagram tiktok spotify you know you name it you'll find me there uh check out the songs leave comments let me know what you think i'd be really curious to see if people are feeling the records oh yeah and then uh, any other plugs, any other shout outs, anybody else you'd like to put on while you're on here? Most definitely. I want to shout out Rosie. Rosie was a huge um, catalyst to my growth as an artist. When I entered the scene in Portland, I met Kay Wayne. And then, you know, he introduced me to King Tay, who was on the show. Mm-hmm. And then um, Silas, who was part of that group before he left, Silas One Wolf, uh, Trey Fordeuce. This group uh, Trey Fordeuce. really helped like mold me because... They were skilled in a lot of areas that I was not, Mm -hmm. but they would never let me not know the value that I held in the group. Do you know what I'm saying? Like I would get kind of insecure and then they're like, no, this is why you're here. And, um, you know, even just on the practicals, like K Wayne bringing me out to a show and being right next to me, performing with me, Mm -hmm. boosting my confidence. He's an excellent performer. 
Um, and so I just wanted to shout those guys out. I ran into Wavy Joseph at Trader Joe's oh, recently. Shout out Wavy. Joseph. Yeah. He's also an incredible performer. And I think just seeing friendly faces around town, even if you run into them unexpectedly, mm-hmm. that's like a huge help. So just shouting out those guys. Thank you for sewing into me because I wouldn't be who I am without you guys. So thank you. Hell yeah. All right. With that being said, we've got one last question to go. But before we do, I'm going to steal the camera for just a second. Okay. As always, y'all, please make sure to like, subscribe, push all the buttons, do all the things. You know, I don't know where they are, but you do, and I trust you. And one more shout out to the Brothers Apothecary, Ronald Records, and Portland Water. Thanks for keeping us hydrated. And with that being said, the final question. And this is entirely up to your interpretation. But what is an album you feel is more on the obscure side? So it's a deep cut. It's one not a lot of people would know. But it's when you think everybody should know. Just because I've spent most of my time in like the hip hop community, Mm -hmm. I feel like I would want people to know this record. They probably do because the lead single did get radio play, but I'm still going to shout it out anyway. One of my favorite records of all time is the Postal Service Give Up. Oh, hell yeah. I love it. I feel like it shouts out the Northwest. Mm -hmm. It created a vibe for what is the Northwest. Yeah. Um, You've... So much music like inspires like what I create, you know, and it doesn't have to just be hip hop R and B. Like mm-hmm. that album I've played front to back so many times. It gives me peace. It makes me feel uh, great. And then um, he's so unique, you know. Mm-hmm. He used his voice and his pen to like create this unique experience. And he's also part of Death Cab for Cutie. So there's all of that. But I'm just saying that album was just really cool, especially how it was made. Like snail mail. It's called Postal mm-hmm. Service because they sent demos and parts back and forth snail mail and the whole album oh, damn. that way and so that's just like insane i can't imagine because we just talked about collaborating with yeah you. anyway it's just incredible so hell yeah well that's that's a super solid wreck thank you so much yeah all right but with that being said we're gonna go ahead and get up on out of here thank you so much for joining us Absolutely, today dude thank you yeah and this has been another exciting episode of jimmy's jam box i'm jimmy and i'm jamie fortune and we're signing off later y'all peace that's a wrap. Keep jamming.